Hello and welcome again to Praxis Group International, where I teach you exactly what ETS requires of you to earn a respectable passing score on your TOEFL IBT. Hello, my name is Mr. Hearn and I am your TOEFL tutor. In this video, I'm going to teach you a skill I call sentence simplification. Now, this is different than the other sentence simplification videos you've seen because those people are talking about answering the highlighted sentence question or the paraphrase questions. I don't know why they call them sentence simplification questions. They're not. But this is different. The skill I'm about to teach you is called sentence simplification because I'm going to teach you how to simplify your sentences that you're reading. In other words, I'm going to teach you how to read less, understand more, and earn a higher score on your TOEFL IBT. You see, one of the ways that ETS beats us is by time. We simply don't have enough time to read everything in each reading passage or in some of the other passages, like the speaking and writing sections, we don't have enough time to read everything. Well, the good news is you don't have to. You know, most of my students come to me and they say, Mr. I just don't have enough time. I mean, I get all the way through up until about the end of the last, the last section, and they can't answer the last four or five questions because they just simply run out of time. Maybe that's you. Maybe you can answer most of the questions on the test very well, but you simply run out of time on the last passage and have to guess. That will end as soon as you master this skill. Another thing is that ETS puts a lot of confusing words in the passage, difficult words that may make you feel that you don't know English and they rob you of your confidence and give you anxiety. But if you don't have to read those stupid words, hey, all the better. So I'm gonna teach you this skill and you're going to be able to look at your test in a different way with greater confidence and be able to answer questions in less time. That's the whole idea, right? Being able to answer questions quickly, easily, and accurately. Now, all right. Now, understand this. The TOEFL IBT is not a test of English as a foreign language. I know, right? What do you mean? T-O-E-F-L, test of English as a foreign language. But it's not a test of English. It's not about reading comprehension. It's about knowing your study skills. You see, the test of English as a foreign language is really a test of college readiness for the United States. Understand that the same people that make the TOEFL IBT are the same people that make all of your books and tests while you're in university. That's why the higher score you get on your TOEFL, the greater chances you are you have to get into a better university. Understand? All right. So by learning this skill, It'll give you the ability to get that higher score you really need to give you more opportunities. More opportunities means that when you're applying to a university that requires a minimum score of 95, you need to score 100 to be accepted. It's 95 to apply, 100 to be accepted. If you're applying to a university that requires a score of 100, you need to score 107 or better to be accepted. Oh yeah. You can apply with a score of 100, mm, but you won't be accepted unless you have a score of 107 or better. I know. We do college placement as well at Practice Group International. So I'm doing everything I can to help you to beat this stupid test, to move on with your life. So let's talk about uh, sentence simplification and what we're about to do here. I'm going to show you 10 sentence structures. That is 10 sentence structures. These are the typical sentence structures that you would see on the TOEFL IBT. And by seeing these structures, it'll help you to know what to do when you see a sentence on a test with a similar structure so that you just automatically start working the procedure and then you automatically can read less, save time, right? All right, let's take a look at the first sentence and then I'm going to show you how to do it. Take a look. Now here we have three sentences. These are just three basic sentence structures as you would see on the TOEFL IBT. You can see that there's a lot of words in these sentences and maybe they can be a little confusing as well. I want you to take a moment, pause this video, 
and see if you can figure out for yourself what is the subject and what is the subject doing in each sentence. In other words, what's the main idea for each sentence? The main idea is that part of the sentence that answers the question, who or what is doing what? So take a moment, pause the video, write down what you think the main focus of the sentence is. Okay, now most of my students that do this, they have an answer and you're pretty sure that what you have decided is, is correct or at least reasonable. But now I'm gonna show you exactly how the English language is structured. You see, way back in the day, I used to teach English, but I don't teach it the way other people do. I don't teach you sentence phrases so that you just sort of have to memorize phrases to say. I teach language according to the structure of the language to make it functional for you. So understand that English language is pretty easy to learn once you know the structure and the function of each part of a sentence. But let me show you how it works. And believe me, this isn't just for the TOEFL. I mean, it's gonna work on all four sections of the TOEFL. You need it for all four sections of the TOEFL. But all of my students tell me that this is the most valuable skill that they've learned because it works outside the TOEFL. You're gonna pass the TOEFL and never deal with it again. You are gonna pass. I don't care how many times you failed in the past. Now, if you do what I teach you, you are passing your TOEFL, not gonna, not will, you are passing your TOEFL. So I'm gonna show you how language is structured so that you understand English way better, right? Here, take a look. Sentence simplification. Every sentence tells a story. It tells us who or what is doing what, did what, or will do what. Sentences are broken into sections with the specific functions each telling a specific part of the story. But the basic understanding of a sentence comes in knowing the answer to the question, who or what is doing what. Without knowing the subject of a sentence, there is a disconnect in understanding, leaving one with a sense of confusion in which we must either reread a sentence several times in hopes of getting the meaning, or worse, in a live setting of a conversation or a lecture, one is simply lost and cannot catch up. Has this ever happened to you? You're reading something and you think you know what you're reading and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, what are they talking about? And you have to go back and read it again. This has nothing to do with English being your second language because I can tell you that many people that English is their first language have to do the same thing. And you might have to do it yourself when you're reading in your own language. Or how about in a conversation or at university in a lecture where you're listening to the professor or someone talking to you and you think you understand what they're saying, but then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, what are you saying? And they have to repeat themselves. Doesn't this feel frustrating? Doesn't it make you feel a little dumb or at least it just wastes time to have to read and you don't understand, you have to go back and read again? Well, in real life, that's frustrating, but on the TOEFL IBT, that's devastating. So we need to be able to read something once and understand it. We need to be able to hear something once and understand it and be able to use that information to answer questions quickly, easily, and accurately. So let me show you exactly how to do this skill, what I call a power. It's a power because once you understand everything the first time through, most people don't. This is not a skill that comes naturally. It doesn't come easily to most people. But once you have it, you have a skill that 99% of the people on the planet don't have. And when you're in a room with 40 people who are confused and lost, who's the boss? That's right, you. Let's take a look at how it works. And therefore, finding and knowing the subject of a sentence is imperative to learning. However, and knowing the subject of a sentence isn't as easy as just finding the noun in the sentence, because there are often several nouns in the sentence. The same is true for verbs. There are often several verbs in the sentence, and it can be confusing trying to discern which verb in the sentence is doing the action, because an intelligent person can reason anything to be true or to make sense. So how do we quickly and accurately find the root of a sentence? 
that part that tells us who or what is doing what, through a process of training our brain to recognize the functions of each part of the sentence and categorizing them accordingly. This is a simple process, but not easy at first. It doesn't come naturally and is a skill that must be practiced until it becomes first nature. It is made easier by a process of elimination. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I want to talk to you about this process of elimination. You may not think that, oh, mister, this is not a big deal. I don't need this for the TOEFL, but I'm telling you that everything on the TOEFL IBT hinges on this skill. And the process of elimination is the one thing you're going to use on the reading and listening sections to get that high score. When I say high, I mean over 25 in each section, all right? What I want you to have is a respectable passing score or a high score of over 25 in each section. Understand that for the reading and listening passages, they give you the answers. Yeah, that's right. They give you the answers. It's a multiple guess test. They give you the answers. So if they're giving you the answers, why is it so hard to answer the questions on this stupid test? It's, it's because they make the test to be very confusing and to create a lot of anxiety while you're taking the test. Have you noticed? While you're taking it, you have this extra self-talk saying, oh my God, this is going to take too long. This is confusing. Why do I even have to take this test? Yes, it is all the by design, right? This wasted time of negative thinking is built into the test. By learning sentence simplification, you'll eliminate those thoughts or as best as you can eliminate anxiety and you'll eliminate confusion by reading less. Now I'm going to show you some steps and I want you to follow these steps, right? In order that I teach you. And if you do this, everything will be much easier. Everything will be much easier. You'll be able to read less, understand more, get a higher score. All right. Step by step, remember, it's not about finding the answers. On the TOEFL IBT, there are no right answers. There's only wrong choices based on the clue in the passage and eliminating wrong choices. So I'm going to teach you how to get yourself into the right mindset to master the TOEFL IBT and easily get a higher score. Now, I know some of my students said, Mr. Don't say easy. Everybody says it's easy. No, easier. Okay. One, you don't know what you're doing. Everything's hard. But when you know what you're doing and you practice enough to get good at it, it gets easier. So I'm going to show you how to make it easier. Take a look. Here's the instructions that I would like you to follow. And the more you stick to it, the easier things get. Number one, eliminate prepositional phrases at the beginning of the sentence that are offset by commas. Number two, eliminate descriptive phrases that are offset by commas. Descriptive phrases describe the word they are next to, but are separated from that word by a comma. Number three, eliminate adjectives and adverbs. Adjectives give description to the nouns they are next to. Adverbs give description to the verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. They usually end in ly. Number four, eliminate anything associated with the word of. People most often mistake the object of the preposition of with the subject. Number five, unless at the beginning of a sentence, eliminate everything after the word by all the way to the period. Once you have eliminated these parts of a sentence, the only thing left is the subject, its related verb, and a brief description of what the subject is doing. If you're still having difficulty finding the subject, look for these helper verbs is, are, was, were, has, have, had, do, does, did, and to. Not every sentence has these verbs, but most do. When you find one of these helper verbs, ask yourself, for example, who is or what is. The sentence will answer that question. Keep in mind that these parts of the sentence that we are eliminating for this exercise are only for training purposes. Each of these parts is important to the sentence as a whole. They answer any question that can be asked about the subject or what the subject is doing. This exercise is designed to help you to understand sentences more fully and thus receive a more enriched education. All right, let me take a moment to point something out. 
I call these verbs helper verbs. In real life, they're actually called auxiliary verbs. You'll find as you watch my videos that I don't use technical terms. I use terms that make sense to me and hopefully make sense to you. For example, I call these helper verbs, is, are, was, were, has, have, had, do, does, did, and to, because auxiliary doesn't make sense to me. I mean, when you think of auxiliary, what do you think of? The aux cord for, uh, for a stereo, for example. The aux is usually something extra, right? It's something that we don't need right now, and we only use it if we need it. Well, these verbs are not extra verbs. They help us. They help us to tell uh, if the subject is singular or plural, if it's past or present. They help us to find the subject in the sentence. So I call them helper verbs. Just like I don't call the highlighted sentence questions sentence simplification or paraphrase questions because you're not really paraphrasing. And watch my paraphrase sentence or highlight sentence question video for that. I call it highlighted sentence because in the passage, there's a highlighted sentence. And then the question, it says highlighted sentence. So you, you can't get it wrong. I love that about my classes. I mean, I just make everything so easy. Okay. Let's take a look at some sentences and see how this skill works. Okay. Here we are back where we started with our three sentences. Now, keep in mind what you think is the main idea of each sentence. And we're going to see if you want to keep your idea or change your idea. Taking a look at sentence number one, the first thing we're going to do is look for prepositional phrases at the beginning of the sentence offset by a comma. We look at our sentence and we say, yes, here's a comma. And going before our sentence, is this a prepositional phrase? No, it's a noun. I don't have any rules for eliminating nouns before the first comma. So now I can move on to see, are there any descriptive phrases in this sentence? I look at my sentence and I say, is there another comma? Yes, there's a comma here and a comma here. Now, looking for descriptive phrases. When I have a phrase between two commas in the middle of a sentence, I want to look to see, is there a noun before the first comma? and a related verb after the second comma. In this case, there is. Butterflies migrate. So I can just ignore everything in between. That's right. I didn't read it at all. I'm not reading for reasoning. I am just following procedures. It turns it into a mechanical test, so we read less. Now, monarch butterflies. What else do I have? I have this other comma. But this other comma, this comma here, is separating things in a list. If you go back and look at the five procedures that I have, there's nothing about eliminating things in the list, and therefore I can ignore this comma. So what's next? Step three, eliminate adjectives. Starting at the beginning of my sentence, I see this word monarch, and it's describing the butterflies. Now, some people could argue that monarch is a proper noun, and so it's necessary. However, I'm using a strict rule to eliminate adjectives. And that way, I'm not trying to think too much. I'm just doing the action. So monarch is describing the butterflies. I've eliminated it. Are there any other adjectives here? We have this word far. So I've eliminated monarch. I've eliminated far. Do I have any other adjectives here? Mm, one could argue that Western, Midwestern, and Eastern is describing the United States. You could really argue that United is describing the states. Okay, I'll allow it if you want to be that strict. If you don't want to be that strict, it's okay. But what else? What other rules do I have? Do I have the word of? I do, but you'll notice that I've already eliminated those things associated with the word of when I eliminated the descriptive phrase. But I'm going to look at them and eliminate them again anyway, just so that I make sure I do each rule in turn. And the last rule is by. 
Do I have the word by in the sentence? I don't. Do I have any more rules? I don't. Well, and by the way, if you're not sure about the rules, you can always go back earlier in the video to where the rules are and write them down. It helps a lot. Now that I've used all my rules, the only thing that's left is the main idea of my sentence. In this case, butterflies migrate where? Into the states each year. Now, I could just say, you know what? Butterflies migrate into the states. That's really the main idea. Each year gives me a little bit more information, but it isn't necessary. It's not the main idea. Okay, so this may seem a little confusing at first. And you're like, mister, how am I going to do this on the test? This is going to take a long time, isn't it? No. Like anything else, when you first start learning a new skill, it does seem to take longer. But as you learn the skill and just do it, it becomes automatic. And that's our goal, is to be able to look at sentences to categorize the different parts, right? and to know what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. See, when the, you read a question on the TOEFL reading section, it's gonna ask you about something specific from the passage, from a paragraph, likely. It's gonna ask you about a topic and something about that topic. You're gonna to have to look at your paragraph, find that topic, and read what it says about that topic, and then eliminate choices that are different from what's stated in the passage or not mentioned. Now, if that doesn't make sense, watch my other videos, because I'm telling you, once you know how ETS wants you to answer questions, it's so much easier, really, so much easier. Let's take a look at sentence number two. Oh, by the way, is that the answer you had, that butterflies migrate into the United States each year? If not, let's keep going. Sentence number two. Here we are back at our sentences, and I'm at sentence number two. I'm looking for the first comma in the sentence, and I find it here. I look before the first comma, and I say, is this a prepositional phrase? The word in is a preposition, so this is a prepositional phrase. I can eliminate that. Now, do I have any other commas? I do. So do I just eliminate everything in between the commas? No. I don't have a rule that says eliminate everything between commas. So what was my rule? Oh, I know, I keep interrupting you, but I wanna let you know about this very important aspect of the commas rule. It can be confusing. Sometimes we get confused. Do I eliminate what's between the commas? Do I not eliminate what's between the commas? Well, I didn't really clarify that in my rule. So I'm gonna clarify that now. You see, descriptive phrases can come at the beginning of a sentence, in the middle of a sentence or at the end of a sentence. If they're in the beginning of the sentence, you'll find that they're describing the noun just to the right of the comma. In other words, you'll see your first comma. It's not a prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence. It's something describing a noun just after that comma. So you want to eliminate descriptive phrases at the beginning of a sentence. What about descriptive phrases in the middle of a sentence? Well, as we saw in that first sentence, butterflies, blah, 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 comma, migrate. When we have a noun, a description of that noun, and then another comma, and a verb, we can eliminate those things between those two commas because we have the noun being described before the first comma and its related verb after the second comma. Now, there are there are descriptive phrases that come at the end of a sentence, right? So you have a noun, comma, and then a phrase that goes usually to the period, and that ends the sentence. So watch for these things. If you have more than one comma in the sentence, if you don't have a verb at the end of a second comma, it's not a descriptive phrase, separating the noun being described from its related verb. All right, let's take a look at this sentence and see how it works. I hope it's not getting too confusing, but as you practice, I can assure you it gets so much easier. Let's keep going. All right, following the rules, we have eliminated the prepositional phrase at the beginning of the sentence. We have another comma. 
we look before the first comma, there is a noun here, but which is not a verb. Therefore, I can't eliminate everything between the commas. But what about this comma here? What do I do? Well, I have a carburetor. If you don't know what a carburetor is, it is something which mixes the correct amount of fuel and air inside the combustion chamber. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter because we're not reading to learn on the TOEFL IBT. Say that again. We are not reading to learn on the TOEFL IBT. So if there are words you don't know, it doesn't matter. We're just looking for related information. That's why sentence simplification works. Now, what do I have left? I've eliminated prepositional phrases at the beginning of a sentence. I have eliminated descriptive phrases that are offset by commas. I need to look for words that are adjectives or adverbs. Adverbs end in L-Y. Do I have any adjectives? Fuel entering the engine is combined with an oxidizer. No, there are no adjectives. There are no words ending in L-Y. Do I have any word, uh, phrases beginning with of? No. Do I have the word by anywhere in the sentence? No. Therefore, I'm done. What's the main idea? Fuel entering the engine is combined with an oxidizer via the carburetor. That is the main idea of this sentence. Now, we've eliminated some things. And you might think, but Mr., the sentence doesn't make sense after I've eliminated those things. The sentence does not have to make sense to be able to answer the questions. You need to read the, the you, mm, you need to watch the other videos of how to answer these questions to understand what I mean by it's not a test of reading comprehension. You don't have to make sense of everything to understand how to eliminate wrong choices. This is very important if you're going to get a score over 20 on your TOEFL reading section. So now we have, we have learned that we just have to follow rules. Don't think, just do, right? It's not reasoning out whether we should eliminate or not. There's an exact rule of whether we should eliminate something or not. Let's keep going to number three so that you learn that don't think, just do. You see, the TOEFL IBT is testing you on two things. Do you know the rules that ETS has for the test? Are you willing to obey those rules? At the beginning of the video, I said, I teach you what ETS requires of you to get a respectable passing score in your TOEFL IBT. It's all about knowing ETS's rules and obeying their rules. Let's take a look at sentence number three. So here we are at sentence three, and I'm just going to get right into it. Going to my first comma, is this a prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence? No. So I can leave it. What about the other commas? There's a comma here and a comma here. So Wilbur and Orville, comma. I have a noun before the first comma, but this is not a verb after that comma. So I'm going to leave that part. But I have another comma here. Okay, I have a noun before the first comma and a verb coming after that comma. So I'm going to eliminate that part. Notice that I'm not thinking at all. I'm just doing. And that's the main idea. Know your rules, obey the rules. Now let's see what do I have next. Ah, yes, this comma between Kitty Hawk and North Carolina. This comma is separating a city from a state. I don't have any rules for that. So I'm not going to do anything with this comma. You see, don't add any rules. Don't leave any rules out. Don't change any rules. Just use the rules as I've taught them. Now, what's next? Do we have any adjectives or adverbs? Starting at the beginning of the sentence, we have the Wright brothers. Wright is describing the brothers. And oh, by the way, Wilbur and Orville, that's actually also describing the brothers. So I can eliminate that now. Looking on, do I have any other adjectives? Let's see. First describes piloted. Oh, piloted describes the flight in a power-driven plane. 
Okay, so now I've eliminated all my adjectives. Do I have any adverbs, those words that usually end in L-Y? No words that end in L-Y. Now I do know that there are adverbs that don't end in L-Y. I don't care. Keep it simple, just moving on. Do I have the word of in this sentence? No, I don't. So I can skip that. What about the word by? Do I have the word by in this sentence? No, I don't. Do I have any more rules? No, I don't. So what happened here? The brothers made history. And really, that is the basic sentence. The brothers made history. The rest of this information is telling more of the story that I could either pay attention to if the question is asking about that, or I could ignore that information if the question is not asking specifically about that other information. Are you starting to get the idea? We're not reading for comprehension. We're just knowing our rules, our procedures, and applying the procedures. Don't add any rules. Don't twist anything, right? Don't change anything. Don't leave any rules out. Once you've eliminated those things that I say to separate based on the rules, the only thing that's left is the main idea. And as you do this, your brain will start doing things automatically. Just as we saw that first comma, is that a prepositional phrase at the beginning of the sentence? Yes or no. If it's no, then leave it. If it's yes, eliminate it. Keep in mind that the things that we're eliminating may be necessary if the question is asking about that stuff. But if the question isn't asking about that, we don't have to pay any attention to it. Let's take a look at sentence number four. And here we have three more sentences. And let me ask you a question before you start trying to figure it out. Now, you could pause the video at this moment and see if you can work the procedures yourself. And then we'll continue and see if your answer matches my answer after following the procedures. Before we do that though, I wanna ask you a question. Looking at these sentences, how do they make you feel? Do some of them make you feel nervous? Do they have some words that might be intimidating or confusing to you? It, it's important that we recognize that the TOEFL IBT isn't hard, it's just tricky. You see, ETS does everything they can to intimidate you, create anxiety, to confuse you, to rob you of your confidence so that you start wasting time on the test and picking wrong choices. When you look at a sentence, rather than see, oh, this is too long, it's gonna be confusing, I hate this, I speak English, why do I even have to take the test? Rather than falling down that rabbit hole, let's not even think about what the sentence is about. We're not reading for understanding, we're reading for related information information that's related to the question that we're being asked, or information that is related to one of the choices that we're looking at that comes after the question. So let's take a look at these three sentences in a way that's going to eliminate anxiety, or as much as we can. I wish I could eliminate anxiety completely, but <laughs> yeah. Let's eliminate anxiety as much as we can and eliminate the confusion by eliminating words that we don't need to know. Take a look. In this first sentence, all I'm going to do is look to see, are there any commas? Number one, is this a prepositional phrase at the beginning of the sentence? Before is a preposition. Therefore, I don't even read this. I just ignore it. And I see there's another comma here. Mm -hmm. And Nikola Tesla is a noun. I don't have any rules for eliminating that, but I do have another comma here. So I look to see, is there information between commas? Yes. Is there a noun before the first comma and a verb after the second comma? Yes, there is. So I just eliminate that. So now what do I have? I need to know, are there any other commas? No. Are there any Adjectives or adverbs. Well, detail describes the description. Collier's Magazine, eh, we could argue that that's the name of the magazine and I don't care. So I just want to simplify. 
Do I have any adverbs? Hmm. No, no words ending in L-Y. Do we have the word of? Yes, we do. Of this device. So it's of and the noun it's associated with. So I've eliminated that. Do I have the word by? I do not. Do I have any more rules? I do not. Therefore, I just say, what's the main idea of my sentence? Nikola Tesla gave a description, and that's what he did. Nikola Tesla gave a description. The rest of the information can be used to answer any question that could be asked about Nikola Tesla or what he did. Let's take a look at sentence number five. Following the rules, I go to my first comma. Is this a prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence? Well, it is not necessarily a preposition. I know we have the word of, but I'll come back to that because I have a special rule for the word of. What about any other commas? Well, I have one here. The question I have now is, is there a noun before the first comma and a verb that follows the second comma? I have provides, and therefore, I have noun before the first comma, so I can just eliminate that without even paying attention to it. And let's see, any other commas? Oh, yes, I have a comma here. So what about that? Protecting the earth, blah, 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 magnetic field, right? And all of this is a descriptive phrase at the end of the sentence. So I don't even have to read that at all. I don't need to know that unless my question is asking about it. So I want to know now, do I have any adjectives? Molten describes the steel. Magnetic describes the field. Do I have any adverbs? Words that end in L-Y? I do not. So moving on, do I have the word of? I do, right here, of molten steel. Excellent. Do I have the word by? I do not. Do I have any more rules? I do not. What's happening here? The core provides the earth with a field. That's what's happening. That's the main idea. Everything else that I have eliminated for the moment, I can use that information to answer any question that could be asked about the core or about the magnetic field. For example, if the question were asking what the core was made of, I would say that it is made of molten steel. And if the question was asking me where that core was, I would say that it's spinning deep inside the Earth's center. And what does this magnetic field do? It protects the Earth from the effects of solar radiation and other damaging cosmic rays. All right, let's move on to sentence number six. First, what do I do? First comma. Is this a preposition at the beginning of a sentence? I have the word in, and I can eliminate. And then I have another comma. And another comma. And so I have this noun. And then I have this verb. Is this describing Thomas Edison? Yes, it is. It's a phrase that comes between the noun being described and its related verb. Do I have any other commas? Mm, yes, but I don't have a rule for eliminating commas within numbers, so I can just ignore that. And let's see, what else? Do I have any adjectives? Light describes the bulb. Carbonized and bamboo describes the filament. And I have no more adjectives. So do I have any adverbs? Words ending in L-Y? I do not. Do I have the word of? I do not. Do I have the word by? Yes, right there. So I can just eliminate everything all the way to the period. Do I have any more rules? I do not. Therefore, what is left is my sentence. Thomas Edison developed a bulb that would burn for 1,200 hours. Actually, he developed a bulb, and the rest is just a little more information if you need it. Excellent. Did you get the same answers that you had before we went over each sentence? I hope so. I hope it's getting easier. Let's take a look at three more sentences, and let's see that you're learning that all we have to do is 
step, 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 step. Don't reason, don't read, just do the procedures. And the procedures give you the answers. You know they give you the answers on the test, right? I mean, it's a multiple choice test. If you follow the procedures, they eliminate any chance of getting it wrong. They eliminate all the things that are wrong based on the rules, leaving what's right. That's why it's so important to know your rules and procedures and just apply them mechanically. All right, let's take a look at these three sentences and see how you're doing. Just as before, take a moment to pause the video and use the procedures yourself to see if you can figure out what the main idea of each sentence is. All right, let's get going. In sentence number one, in sentence number one, we have a comma here. Is this a prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence? No. And do we have any other commas? Yes. Well, is this information between commas? Does it come between a noun being described and its related verb? It does. Therefore, I can just ignore that for now. And the next thing is, are there any other commas? Why, yes, there are one here. And so looking at this comma, is this information at the end of a sentence giving description to something? Ah, we have SpaceX, which launched a landmark commercial spacecraft in 2012. It's a descriptive phrase at the end of a sentence. So I can just eliminate that. Now, do I have any adjectives or adverbs, words that end in L-Y? Well, not really. Tesla describes the motors, but it, it doesn't really describe the motors. It's the name of the company. So I'm going to leave that for now. Do I have any words that end in L-Y? No. Do I have the word of? No. Do I have the word by? No. Therefore, I have no more rules, and whatever is left over is my sentence. Elon Musk is known for founding Tesla Motors and SpaceX. That's it. Easy peasy, right? What about sentence number eight? Oof. Take a moment and work on this sentence yourself and see if you can tell me what is the subject of sentence number eight. All right, let me take a crack at it. I'm going to look for commas. I have one here. Is this a prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence? No. But is this a descriptive phrase coming after the comma? It is. It's describing the course of Acts of 1774. I can just eliminate that for now. Do I have any more commas? No. Do I have any adjectives or adverbs? Words that end in L-Y. Adjectives? Hmm. I have main consequences, Boston Tea Party, British is describing the government and the course of Acts of 1774. Okay. Do I have any words that end in L-Y? No. Do I have any phrases that begin with of? Oh, yes, I do. Of the main consequences and of the Boston Tea Party and of 1774. One could argue that that's part of the name of the course of Acts of 1774. I don't care. I'm just obeying the rule. Don't think, know the rules, apply the rules. Do I have the word by in this sentence? I do not. And therefore, I have no more rules. I'm done. So I'm just going to underline those parts that are left because whatever's left after I've eliminated based on the rules is the main idea of my sentence. So I have one was the government established the course of acts. Okay. So what is the subject of this sentence? If you said it's the consequences, eh, nope. If you said it's the Boston Tea Party, no, it isn't. We've eliminated those things. If you said it's the British government, no, that too is not correct. Is it the course of acts of 1774? No. Is it Great Britain? No, we've eliminated all those things. What could the subject of this sentence be? Well, Remember our standby of helper verbs. Is, are, was, were, has, have, had, do, does, did, and to. Not every sentence has them, but most do. I find the word was, and then I ask myself who was or what was. And I look before my helper verb. 
and I go back to the only word that was not eliminated, one. One is the subject. But you may say, Mr., that doesn't make any sense. Well, things don't have to make sense on the TOEFL IBT. They just have to obey ETS's structure and rules. Let's think about this word, one. Why does it not seem like the subject? You see, in our mind, the subject is something solid, a person, place, or thing, right? But see, the subject of a sentence can be living, non-living, or a concept or an idea. One is a pronoun representing something previously mentioned, and therefore it doesn't have a substance of its own. It represents something of substance. It was in the previous sentence. Don't allow yourself to get fooled when you feel that uneasy about something to say that it doesn't make sense. We're not reading for things to make sense. We're reading for the main idea of a sentence and for information that is directly related for the question. All right, let's take a look at the next sentence and let's solve it quickly. Come on, let's just do it. Sentence number nine. Before I jump into this, look at this sentence. How does it make you feel? Is it a little long? Does it make you feel like, oh my, there's too much here to read. This is going to take a long time to figure out. Well, maybe, but let's use our rules, shall we? I go to my first comma. Is this a prepositional phrase at the beginning of the sentence? No, I'm going to leave it. Are there any more commas? Why, yes. Is there a noun before the first comma and a verb following the second comma? Yes. Therefore, I can just ignore all of that. Are there any other commas? Hmm. I have this comma here, but it's in a date, so I can leave that. What about this comma? Is this a descriptive phrase at the end of a sentence? Even though it's long. Oh, look here. I've got this comma here as well. Oh, my goodness. And this comma. Wow, this is a really complicated sentence. This will take forever. Will it really? Not necessarily. You know what? As I go through here, I'm looking at all of these different commas, and I realize there's a shortcut that I can take. Do I have the word by? Unless at the beginning of a sentence, eliminate everything after the word by all the way to the period. What just happened? My sentence just became airplanes were realized. Did you see what I did? I know I skipped through steps, but not really. What I did was I used a little trick because I'm advanced. I can do that. In this particular sentence, I saw the word by and I was able to bypass all those other rules because it is a finite rule. When you see the word by in the sentence, unless it's the first word in the sentence, you see the word by, eliminate everything after that word all the way to the period. You don't need to know that stuff. So a sentence that was very long and intimidating was suddenly cut down to three words. I know, right? It's so crazy. I love the rules. I love the rules. Learn your rules. Know your rules. Obey your rules. The rules will keep you safe. The rules is why the TOEFL IBT is fair. Now, you may hear me from time to time saying that I really don't like ETS. I don't think they're fair. I don't think they're fair in many ways. However, the test itself, the TOEFL IBT, is very fair because it is a standardized test. It has absolute structures and rules that everyone and anyone from anywhere in the world, if you know the structures and rules that they use to make the test and you get good at applying those rules to the test, you can get a higher and higher and higher score. It's really, it's really an amazing thing. Listen, that's all I do. I know ETS 
and I know their rules. I've been studying this test since 2007. I've been studying my students and I teach you exactly what ETS requires of you to get a high score or what I call a respectable passing score on your TOEFL IBT. I really want you to pass. I really do. And by learning the things that I teach you step-by-step step and applying it to the test, you will pass your TOEFL IBT. All right, I'm gonna leave you with one more sentence. I'm not gonna answer it for you. What I would like you to do is leave your response in the comments below of what you think is the simplified form of this sentence. And if you've learned something new in this video, please subscribe, like, share, ring the bell. You know what to do. Also, if you'd like to see more videos, more in-depth videos of how to answer each question exactly how ETS wants you to, go to my website and subscribe to my YouTube, my TOEFL video course, <laughs> not my YouTube already described, you've already subscribed to YouTube, subscribe to my video course where you can meet other TOEFL students. You can ask me any questions anytime, day or night. I'm always answering questions for my students from all over the world. And every other weekend, I have a live Q&A. So you can ask me questions about the TOEFL IBT or any other questions you have about moving to the United States, going to university, we get into a lot of different things here. I really look forward to seeing you. Thank you for sticking with me this long. And if you haven't passed the TOEFL yet, don't give up. Understand, it's not that you will pass. You are passing. Stick with me, and I'll make sure you pass. All right. See you in the next video.